theory is so important to be an esthetician is not just about the practical stuff. It's not just about the hands on items. Theory is a part of that. Okay. So chemistry, here's what we're going to talk about today, guys. I hope you get excited because <clears throat> if you were interested in and starting your own skincare line, what do you think you need to understand the most? Chemistry, chemistry and understanding how products work together with actual active ingredients versus the vehicles, versus the fillers, versus everything that holds the product and suspends it into what it's supposed to be. So this is so important. This is truly very elementary chemistry education in my personal opinion, so it shouldn't be too crazy. And when you are on this chapter, it should be pretty easy to pass it, but I will tell you that this is going to be on state board. Absolutely. Okay. The pH scale seems easy and it is, it really is, but really understanding it as an esthetician is probably one of my more fun things to do. I actually love chemistry more now because, you know, when we're talking about acidic serums or acidic chemical peels, I need to understand why something would work more aggressively than others, right? Or of course, more neutral items. We'll talk about that. Basic or alkaline. The biggest thing you could just write down right this minute, if you don't already know this, is basic or alkaline products on the skin are pretty terrible. And here is why. Look at everything in the 10 and above, okay? We have ammonia, we have soapy water. So soaps like detergent laden soaps, drain cleaner. Those are very aggressive cleaning solutions oftentimes, and they're very um, stripping of the lipid barrier. And y'all heard me say that before, but it's good to look at it from this perspective too. When you strip off the lipid barrier of your cells, you're going to either become more dry or more oily, depending upon what your DNA allows you to do, right? So with that being said, can you use you know, Dove soap, which is very alkaline, or can you use your Dawn dish soap, you know, to wash your skin? That's also very alkaline. The answer is no. If you do that on your hands, you know, even on your hands, you see that you become dry and cracked and just, it's not a good thing. You're wondering, well, where's my lipid barrier structure? Why am I not feeling hydrated? And it's because you are stripping that lipid barrier protection and it's just not a good thing. When you start using that sort of thing on your face, initially you'll feel very squeaky clean, right? But it's not good. That is going to overproduce acne, overproduce oil or overproduce dryness. It actually completely takes off the protective layer that allows you to shield yourself from environmental toxins or shield yourself from the sun. You know, there's a lot of really good benefits to having a proper barrier on your cells, you know, everywhere in your body, but especially your epithelial tissue, which is your skin. Okay. So look at your neutral points. That's great. Neutral is wonderful. I will tell you that's completely fine. However, when we get closer to the five, four, three, two, one, that is what's going to create something called mitosis. So if you haven't fully held on to that fact yet, please remember that mitosis is what divides cells, right? And that is very important when you're talking about skincare, because if you have someone with very dull, lifeless skin, or you have someone with splotchy hormonal hyperpigmentation, if you have someone with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation from picking at acne lesions over time, I see that often. You need to help them understand that, unfortunately, they're going to have to get used to dealing with some peeling as they work with you as you help them align whatever treatment plan needs to happen so that they achieve their goals, right? They have to deal with that. So one thing that clients will complain about, they're either going to love it because they understand it, right? Or you're going to have people that say, oh, well, I don't like to peel and I don't want a peel because I don't want to peel. And, you know, I shake my head at that and say, okay, well, what am I doing wrong about educating this person? Because yeah, that's annoying and we don't like to peel. And I know people don't like flaky skin. It's hard to wear makeup. And I get that. But there has to be some way for you to meet that client in the middle to explain why that's important, because it's going to be frustrating for you to help them achieve their goals in aesthetics 
if they don't do X, Y, or Z. And if you're not willing to receive chemical peels every so often or to utilize acidic serums at home, you're going to have some real issues on your hands. And here's what the issues are going to be. The clients are gonna start fussing because, well, why am I not seeing this result that you promised me? Or why are we not seeing you know, this outcome that you said we would get? You know, And the answer is just that because they're not complying with what you need from them. And so truly even having a picture of the pH scale and not necessarily listing what all these other, you know, examples are up underneath, but having them understand at least this very simple thing. Look at what it says in blue down at the bottom left corner. It says the pH of the skin is 4.8 to 5.5. It's that range. It's that range. If the client understands that, then they just truly have to understand how acids work with that in order to bring the pH level down to then create mitosis of keratinocytes. It will not work the opposite way. You cannot create mitosis of keratinocytes with alkaline ingredients at all. That will not happen. Don't even think it can. All right. So make sure you understand fully that pHs are a big piece of the puzzle. We can help our clients a lot more effectively because we know more information. The education now is a lot better than it used to be. So make sure you do understand that not only you need to get the pH scale, but your clients need to be the one to really understand this. Otherwise, they're not going to achieve that change and that new cell growth that needs to happen for what conditions, right? For deep lines and wrinkles, for people that have been laying in the tan in bed forever and look like a piece of leather, for people that have been laying in the sun and they have splotchy hyperpigmentation paired with hormonal hyperpigmentation, people that have eczema and psoriasis, they need new cell growth as well. What about people with acne grades one, two, three, and four? Everybody needs new cell growth. So getting people below the four is imperative. I highly recommend it. And if you yourself right now sitting here watching me think never personally had a peel and frankly, I'm nervous about it. You can do this at home, a very light, thin layer. I'll tell you exactly what to do. I'll walk you through the steps because you have to be comfortable with chemical peels. Chemical peeling is an essential part of change. If you can't help them with change, you're most certainly not going to have a client that's going to be dedicated to you for years to come. All right. Okay. This is the slide that I thought you all would appreciate. pH of products need to know for clients and estheticians. So I always talk about tiers of products, right? We talk about over the counter versus professional level. And then of course there's prescription level, which is not listed here because that's neither here nor there. That's just kind of additional items that they would utilize in addition to professional products. Because remember professional clinical grade products that estheticians would recommend are going to be what people need to use all the time. That's where people need to live, right? So let's look here and again, have this visualization of the pH level in your head as we're talking about it. Anything below a seven is going to be considered acidic. Anything above a seven is going to be your alkaline, which is no good. And look at the left pH of your over-the-counter products. And you can try and true test this on your own. You can go to Lowe's today, the home improvement store, and pick up some pH tests that you would use for a swimming pool. All right. And you can test these items. So remember, nothing can be anhydrous, so no oils can be tested appropriately for pH levels, just something that has water in it can, which all these examples would. So look at the cleansers under over-the-counter products. If it's going to be in a pH of 8 to 10, what is that? That's going to be considered to be alkaline. Is that good for your skin? Not really at all. That's going to strip the lipid barrier. So you've you know, started your skincare routine that night or that morning on a bad note anyways. You've thrown your pH level off really crazy. So you may as well just not do anything else. You know, Your serums aren't going to penetrate very well if you've thrown your pH level to be very alkaline, listen to what I just said. You cannot do this and piece it together with over-the-counter and clinical grade products and expect to still receive clinical grade results. You cannot. Look at the cleansers in the professional category. So cleansers in the professional esthetician grade category are typically gonna be between a six and a seven. 
That is a great thing. And here is why. When you have cleansers in a six or a seven, your skin's like, ah, oh, this is good. No big deal. I'm feeling nice and just even toned, um, even pH, nothing crazy is going on. So if you notice too, down the line there of cleansers, acidic serums and nourisher serums in the professional category, nothing goes over that seven. Remember that nothing should go over that pH of seven ever. And your skin's gonna be so happy with you. But I promise you, if you can figure out what clients are using at home, that's causing them not to have the results that you really prefer them to have or that you think they should have at this stage in their treatment plan, that is most likely one of the issues is that they're using something that is very alkaline or something that's not acidic enough. You know, like I've told y'all before, a lot of folks love, love, love their nourisher serums because they're not harsh, right? They're not going to um, cause peeling and, you know, flaking and all that kind of stuff. People are inherently a little nervous about acidic serums because they don't like the tingle. They don't like the flakiness, but that is truly a sign of you getting great results. Even if you just do your acidic serums twice a week, that is way better to me than you just living in this zone, this safe zone. You have to kind of push it off the edge a little bit in order for it to change. Then you can start using your nourishing serums again. All is good. Okay, so we've identified cleansers over the counter. Wah, 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 right? Not good. Your cleansers professional level are great. Six and seven. Between a six and a seven, life is good. We're having a party. Our skin is happy. Okay? Now, let's look at acidic serums on both sides. Your acidic serums that would claim to be as such, I've got a lovely little example for you on the next slide that is a branded item that you're all going to know. Um, acidic serums on the over-the-counter lineup here are between a four and a seven. While that's not horrible, it is not the best. If your skin is a pH of 4.8 to 5.5, are you really getting results when it's staying between a four and a seven? No, because we're not actually bringing the pH down below four, and that is doing your skin a huge disservice. And technically, and I'll show you why you can probably just see why it would be kind of that way without even testing it. I'll show you on the next slide, you're gonna be blown away. Then pH of your professional products on the acidic serum standpoint, look at that. It's gonna be between a two and a four. Isn't that much better when it comes to actual science of your skin being broken down in order to create mitosis to build new cells up? If people are unwilling to do what it takes to have gorgeous, fresh, new skin, and that includes chemical peels and acidic serums, then they're most certainly not going to get the results. And that would be the very first thing I would tell a client. So if you have client Jody over here and she's coming to you and she has deep lines and wrinkles from laying in that tan in bed forever and ever, I'll say, okay, Jody. I know you don't like, you know, chemical peels or you've said you don't and I respect that, but let me tell you something. If you're going to come spend your dollars with me, you're going to need to allow me to help you feel safe with peels. I promise you we can ease you into it. You will love the results. I will help walk you through and I promise, promise, promise that you will be just fine. Just trust me. Please trust me because I want you to get the results that you're coming to me and talking to me about right now because what I listened and heard you say is that you're concerned with deep lines and wrinkles, right? And she'll say, well, yeah. And you will then say, okay, well, we have got to build you up into acidic serums and chemical peels to create new cells. That is the only way to do this. And I promise you, I will help you through the whole thing. And you will come to love chemical peels. And you will understand how to use acidic serums at home to where you're not having those aggravated skin issues or whatever the case may be, because we're going to alternate it or we're just going to use it a couple of times a week and then she'll say okay well you know that sounds really great you have to help people understand that fear 
is just a mindset. They can overcome that. You can help them achieve their goals if they will just allow you to assist them in trying that thing that they were fearful of, right? So acidic serums and chemical peels, I would just put that in your notes as something that clients just inherently are a little nervous about for one various reason or another but you can educate them in such a way to where they will be just fine. It's all about education and all about just jumping in and trying it sometimes, you know? All right, then your pH of over-the-counter products when it comes to nourisher serums are usually gonna be pretty alkaline and that's not great. And the reason why that is, is you're gonna have a lot of your cheaper binders and fillers that are going to be surrounding your active ingredients. It's just simply going to be alkaline no matter which way you look at it. Those very nice active ingredients will also not penetrate to where they need to go. So it's just more or less a marketing ploy anyways. So keep that in mind. You know, you guys have learned a lot of the ingredients feel like all this cohesively comes together. Then the nourisher serums on the professional side. And when I say nourisher, remember what that's supposed to mean. Your nourisher serum should be things that build cells up. You know, your vitamin C's, your antioxidants, your peptides, your um, hyaluronic acid, things of that nature, correct? So that should be between a four and a seven, which it will kind of hug your pH where it is. You know, your natural skin pH is gonna be 4.8 to 5.5. So that's not gonna disrupt the lipid barrier. It's most certainly not gonna break skin cells down because it's not designed to do that. So the pH should be between a four and a seven. PH of products need to know is for clients and estheticians. Reminder, and this is your reminder, AHAs, BHA, retinol, benzoyl peroxide, hydroquinone, those break skin cells down. And then you have your nourishers like ascorbic acid, hyaluronic acid, stem cells, growth factors, peptides. Remember, ascorbic acid is also your vitamin C, right? Those build cells up. Okay, now look here, notice. The pH of professional products does not go into the alkaline or basic zone, which we've said, this just confirms that. Acidic serums must be the pH of our natural skin or lower in order to create change. By change, I mean mitosis, splitting of cells, division of cells, creating brand new cells, and life is good, but that has to happen. Cleansers and nourishing serums, our ingredients that build cells up must be the pH of our skin or higher up to the neutral zone in order to effectively treat cellular health. So pretty much, remember, nothing should go above a seven, and that is an easy way to remember professional grade products, and it is a fun, fun, fun activity to do when you are looking at products and deciding what is good for you, what's good for your client, and all of that. Now, I thought you would love to see this because listen, knowledge is key, right? Look at this. Let's compare, shall we? Ingredient listing. So this is supposed to be a product, obviously, from Neutrogena that is a retinol cream. They call it the Rapid Wrinkle Repair, and they market it to be a retinol product. I mean, look at the box right there, guys. Look at it. It says accelerated retinol. Well, there's nothing accelerated about that retinol product, is it? Because look at where the retinol is located. It's located at the bottom. What do we know about ingredients that are supposed to be active ingredients? We know them to be items that have to be in the first pretty much four, five, six ingredients in the product label. And I say six, probably stretching that out a little bit. It needs to be at least in the top. Let's look at some of these other ingredients as a review. Um, of course, it's got water as the very primary ingredient. And the FDA, of course, requires that you place ingredients in the label from the most to the least percentage. So you're always going to see the most concentrated ingredients at the top. So, of course, it's mostly water. So they're paying for water, right? <laughs> uh, dimethicone. Remember, dimethicone is a silicone based ingredient. And here's how you can remember that silicone, dimethicone. It sounds similar. So, what it is, and I actually like dimethicone very much, but not as an active ingredient as you see it here. Dimethicone, I bet you the way this product feels is like the way a makeup primer feels. Do y'all have makeup primers at home? 
primers feel very silicone like don't they very silky so i promise you with my knowledge of what dimethicone is and what it feels like i bet this feels very primer-esque yes. which unfortunately will actually buffer down any effects of any sort of acid like that retinol way down there at the bottom so you're really not getting a delivery of retinol at all um, it probably feels good going on to the skin and that's pretty much about it. You see this starch octanol succinate that's just, you know, it's an aluminum starch, nothing too crazy there, probably just kind of buffers it a little bit. Another dimethicone, another ammonium cop, um, copolymer, tri, tri, let me think if I can say this one, <laughs> tricyl Siloxane, trisiloxane. Okay. I've not seen that one in a while. That is just, you know, more or less a binder filler. You've got alkyl benzoate. That's a binder filler. Filler. Ascorbyl glucoside. That's a sugar molecule of some kind. Glucoside, glucose. Glycerin. You can write down glycerin. I'm not, you know, against glycerin. I actually like glycerin most of the time. It would be better if glycerin were actually at the top. Glycerin can be a hydrator. It's also a carrier in a lot of products. You will see that. There's nothing wrong with glycerin. That's not a bad product. But again, your active ingredients just simply aren't at the top here. Fragrance typically is not great either unless it's from natural essential oils or something like that. Fragrance is very synthetic and can be very irritating to people's skin. And then titanium dioxide is a sunscreen ingredient. I'm not sure why that's the very last ingredient in there, but of course, none of that actually does a whole lot. So, so very interesting combination of ingredients. I'm not sure why they did it this way. There are companies out there that want marketing level active ingredients which this would be a firm example of that. This means that because it's got retinol in it, they can legally market it to be a retinol product, but that doesn't mean that it's actually gonna deliver retinol into the skin and actually work. Isn't that the saddest thing you've ever heard? I'll repeat that one more time for those of you that didn't hear me. <laughs> there are labs out there that can do this and they do it all the time for pro product lines like Neutrogena that want probably a cheaper cost per SKU so they can make more money, right? Um, what will happen is they can actually ask the lab to do more marketing specific active ingredients in a product, which means that they can market it to be a retinol product like you see here, but it's not actually going to deliver any results for the client or in the skin. And I think that's pretty crappy. Um, for companies to do, but it happens all the time. So if you weren't an ingredient list lover, you will be now. Then this is a better, better um, version of a retinol serum. Let's look at what it's got in it. First thing that's in it is witch hazel water, which is not a bad choice. And I'll say why. I'm not a huge fan of witch hazel because most of the time it's just simply paired with alcohol, which means it's very, very stripping of the lipid barrier. But this has other things in it, which makes me a little bit, you know, less concerned. So we have our witch hazel, we have water, we have alcohol. So that strips everything down, which to me is good for what this product is delivering. So what is it delivering? Look, we have glycolic acid next. So you've kind of stripped the skin a little bit with alcohol and witch hazel to deliver glycolic acid, which produces new cells. Okay. We know glycerin, we talked about that one. That's more of a hydrator, but in this instance, most likely a carrier slash hydrator. We have retinol in the top, so that's great. So that speeds up cell turnover. So this truly to me does say it's gonna do what it says it's gonna do. You've got a carrot seed extract. You've got a cucumber extract. Then you have a flower extract. You have xanthan gum, which thickens it up a little bit. And that's okay when xanthan gum is at the bottom. You just need like a little bit in a product sometimes just to thicken it up. Then you have a bark extract, which is great for just kind of skin clarity, all that good stuff. You have another carrot seed oil, which is really cool. So there's a lot of really great ingredients. I do love about a, um, 
and as the tissue grade retinol as opposed to a prescription grade retinol as the tissue grade retinol products simply give you a good even distribution of retinol whereas prescription grade retinol tends to be really really harsh so people that want like a nice retinol that's not going to peel their skin crazy crazy they would want to get on something like this, right? So who needs retinol is probably a question that you would ask. And I would say anybody that has that issue, like we were just talking about the client Jody that has um, very thick leathery looking skin from laying in the Tina bed, she would be a phenomenal uh, example of somebody that would need a product like to get rid of the sun damage, but this is gonna help shed the skin and also produce new cells in conjunction with whatever else you have the client on. So you see why one product just doesn't do everything. You know, you need something to turn cells over. You need something to actually create new cells. You need something to treat the hyperpigmentation. You need something to treat the acne, you know, that sort of thing. So just food for thought. So let's look at this. Solute versus solvent. Solutes, solvents, and solutions. Let's talk about it. A solvent is a liquid that dissolves a solid liquid or gaseous solute, okay? A solute is a substance dissolved in another substance. Then a solute and solvent make up a solution. Okay, then matter. Of course, this picture off to the side is probably way more complicated than necessary, but this is so easy. Remember this, guys. Matter is a substance that has inertia and occupies physical space, such as a solid, liquid, or gaseous substance. Changes of matter are additionally important. Is it going to be a physical change or is it going to be a chemical change? You know, so physical changes would be water turning into ice. The only thing that changes is the temperature, but the actual physical part of it is still the same. It's still H2O. Whereas chemical changes would be a lot different. Whereas metal turning into rust, it takes one you know, combination there and turns it into a completely different chemical compound. So that would be more or less a chemical change. Okay, so look at what it says here. We just said this. So physical changes can be observed without changing the identity of the substance. So luster, melting, boiling points, density, solubility, odor, phases of matter, that doesn't mean it's going to change the chemistry of it. It's still going to be the same um, actual physical piece of what it is. So examples would be ice versus liquid water is still H2O, physical change. Chemical change can only be observed by changing the identity of the substance. So flammability, ability to rust, pH, toxicity, combustibility, reactivity to water, air, or acids, etc. Those can change the actual chemical composition of matter. So examples would be metal turning into rust. There's plenty of other examples out there. Okay. So the question you might have, what is the chemical reaction for rust? It turns out that what we call rust is a chemical process that combines iron and oxygen to form iron oxide, folks. Thus, by studying rust, we are studying chemistry. What is happening? During this reaction, the iron atoms are passing electrons to the oxygen atoms, a transfer that is called oxidation. Look at this beautiful table of elements. What is an element? Each of more than 100 substances that cannot be chemically interconverted or broken down into simpler substances. Nothing you're gonna be tested on. You just simply need to know the definition of an element. What is a compound is the next one. It's made up or consists of two or more elements. So look at hydrogen, for example. You've got two atoms of hydrogen. Okay. Then what is a molecule? It's a group of atoms bonded together, representing the smallest fundamental unit of a chemical compound. Let's chat aesthetics. What is the chemistry makeup of glycolic acid? Glycolic acid is a small molecule hydroacetic acid that's colorless, odorless, and hydroscopic. These properties make glycolic acid a suitable ingredient for keratolysis, which just means exfoliation and anti-aging applications, which is the stimulation of tissue production and hydration. Glycolic acid is derived from sugar cane and sugar beets. That'd be a test question eventually. You know, where's glycolic acid derived from? Sugar cane primarily. The healing effect of glycolic acid has been demonstrated using high concentrations 
okay? And low pH formulations to promote keratolysis, which just means shedding, the separation of the epidermal layer, all right, from the dermis through accelerated cell loss. The mechanism behind this effect is a weakening of the intercellular corneocyte bonds that disrupt the adhesions of corneocytes, remember those cells at the top, in, lower stratum, in the lower stratum corneum, causing a separation of the bulky upper layer from the newly formed lower layer. All right, so here's some test questions you might have eventually. What has physical properties that we can see, smell, taste, and touch matter as the answer? That makes sense. What causes oxidation? The addition of oxygen or the loss of hydrogen? A good example of that would be how benzoyl peroxide is introduced into the skin. What is an atom with a positive electrical charge? You might see this truly on your um, state board exam. So the answer is a cation, okay? A cation, if you're asking what the question is, you see that here is a positively charged ion. So for example, a sodium ion and an ammonium ion are cations, they're positively charged. So just try to think of ways to remember that one that might be on your exam, okay? Then let's talk about what miscible versus immiscible means to answer this question. So miscible just means mixable. Immiscible means not able to be mixed. Why would they just not say mixable versus non-mixable? I don't know, but it is a scientific term. And I just want you to remember that immiscible means it's not able to be mixed. So what is united with the aid of an emulsifier to create an emulsion? But two or more immiscible substances like oil and water, they're not gonna mix naturally, right? You have to unite it by the aid of a binder and, or emulsifier, but what that is is actually called a surfactant molecule. It has a water-loving head and a oil-loving head, so hydrophilic versus lipophilic. So just remember that's how an emulsion is created. You have to have these other ingredients other than, you know, immiscible substances to have things congeal together and have some sort of shelf life oftentimes. So the question on this one, what is a solution? It's actually a uniform mixture, mixture of two or more mutually miscible substances. So they're mutually miscible and that makes sense. If you're gonna have something that's a solution and they're suspended in one another nicely, they're definitely gonna be miscible substances, meaning they're going to mix. So that should make relative sense. the same element. This would be an elemental molecule and your example would be H2. So two atoms of hydrogen would be an elemental molecule, two or more atoms of the same element. Easy enough, right? What is the difference between water and oil emulsions and oil in water emulsions? I hate this question because it seems very confusing and I don't really like the um, answer, but this is a book question and answer. The answer is emulsions of oil and water. What term means water loving? The answer, when we were talking about the surfactant molecule, remember it's got a water-loving head and a um, oil-loving head. Your water-loving head is hydrophilic, right? Hydro meaning water, okay? And then oil-loving, that side of it, lipo means oil. So the word lipophilic makes sense that it means oil-loving, okay? Then what are suspensions, guys? Suspensions is when you look in the refrigerator and you look at that Italian dressing and everything is separated, right? So suspensions. It's a uniform mixture of two or more substances. Suspensions contain larger par particles than solutions do. Suspensions have a tendency to separate over time. Examples of suspensions, I thought these were neat little um, examples as well. Sometimes in the right light, you'll be able to see particles of dust floating in a room. Eventually the dust will settle on the floor and on furniture and the room will need to be cleaned. Dust in air is a suspension. How about that? Example two, if you go to a beach and mix sand and water in a bucket, you'll form a suspension, won't you? Given time, the sand will settle on the bottom of the bucket to leave clear water. The next one is, what is any substance that is dissolved by a solvent to form a solution? You'll definitely probably have that on state board for sure. Solute. The solute is a substance that is being dissolved by another substance, okay? Then, this is another question you'll have on state board too. What is the study of substances containing carbon? The answer is organic chemistry. 
inorganic chemistry is the study of substances that do not contain carbon, basically the opposite of this answer here. So just remember organic chemistry contains carbon and you are all good. Then this question, put a star by it. This throws people off like you would not believe because you won't see it, but just this one time, this will be on state board and I don't want you to get this wrong. The question is gonna be, how much of the air is made up of nitrogen? Dry air is primarily made up of 78.09% nitrogen, right? We think of the air made, uh, mostly being made up of oxygen that we breathe, but dry air is primarily made up of 78% nitrogen, folks. So make sure you remember that. That will be on state board. Do not forget it, okay? Then what type of substances have a pH level of seven? They're gonna be neutral substances. Pure water is an example. What is reduction? <clears throat> so if oxidation, guys, is the introduction of oxygen and the removal of hydrogen, this is actually gonna be the complete opposite. What is reduction? It's gonna be the loss of oxygen, oxygen or the addition of hydrogen. So keep that in mind. You're gonna see this redox reaction thing as well. So read with me what it says in the green words, okay? An oxidation reduction reaction, also known as a redox reaction, is a type of chemical reaction that involves a transfer of electrons between two species. An oxidation reduction reaction is any chemical reaction in which the oxidation number of a molecule, atom, or ion changes by gaining or losing an electron. Do not get overwhelmed by that. Then the next one is discuss fatty acids and fatty waxes. Fatty acids are a carboxylic acid consisting of a hydrocarbon chain in a terminal carboxyl group, especially any of those occurring as esters in fats and oil. So don't worry too much about this. This is just good information. A fatty wax is a simple lipid, lipids guys, which is an ester of a long chain alcohol and a fatty acid. The alcohol may contain from 12 to 32 carbon atoms. So you might hear us talk about you know, what the cellular membrane is made up of, which is two layers of lipid with water in between. And lipids are made up of oily, waxy coatings, you know, so that's where fatty wax is a simple lipid, you know, it's kind of similar in that realm, nothing too concerning. So just kind of listen, don't worry too much about it, but understanding the lipid barrier is very important. And that is my last slide. So I hope you'll gain some really good information on chemistry today. Mm -hmm.